camera, so hopefully you can see me. And um, do you see the slides, Alex? Yes, we do. All right, that's awesome. Thanks very much for this. And thank you, everyone that still managed to stay this late in the evening, especially if you're in Europe. Obviously, I'm in Massachusetts, nice blue sky outside, um, and it's just starting to be lunchtime. So with that, let me get started. Uh, I'm going to start with this disclaimer, and that is that AMV takes no positions on tools or technologies uh, shown here, and that all statements regarding tools and technologies are the opinions of the speaker, which is me, and I'm pretty sure my legal folks would be amazed that I took the time and effort to say on it. Uh, however, what I want to talk to you about is the application of fast grow. So Christian gave me this tool um, quite some time ago now, and we've been using it at Abvi in the design and services of, of drug-like compounds. And I'm going to give you an update on where we are. So first, let me... Uh, let me just put a pointer on as well. I tend to like to use these. I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Amphi as a pharma company. Talk about how we operate in a design and synthesis environment and explain that a little bit to you. Then the kind of major part of the presentation, I'll be talking about fast grow and how we used it in a retrospective type approach which is interestingly enough, I suppose, but probably of more interest to most people is the prospective use of the tool. And so I'm gonna to touch on that as well and then, and then provide a brief summary. Abby, we spun out of Abbott in 2013. I was looking at this slide earlier today and it occurred to me that when we spun out of Abbott, Essentially, our only product was Humera, a monoclonal antibody for anti-TNF that admittedly made a lot of money for Amphi. Since then, we have expanded our portfolio of, of products and thus within immunology, which is the therapeutic area in which I work, our, our JAK inhibitor, our JAK1 selective inhibitor that came from this site was approved in 2018 and then Skyrizi, a P19 monoclonal antibody, was also approved around that time. Uh, the other therapeutic areas in which we work, oncology, neuroscience, aesthetics, and eye care, uh, you're probably familiar with uh, Abbott's or AbbVie's BCL2 inhibitors. This is essentially a covalent BTK inhibitor. And these products that are in the neuroscience and eye care business were acquired when we bought Allegan. So this diversified our portfolio of products away from a very immunology-centric revenue stream. To support all this, we spend about $6.7 billion annually on, on R&D. There are somewhere, here it is, about 11,000 employees that are in research and development. And the rest of this just talks about the number of clinical trials that we have to run uh, in order to establish products like this. Our R&D sites, you may be familiar with some of these. Obviously, I'll start with Worcester, which is, which is where I am. This is the immunology therapeutic area, as well as some biologic work, some contracting biologic manufacturing work that's, that's done from our site. Our R&D efforts in immunology and neuroscience are down uh, in Cambridge, Mass. There's a new site that we built in South San Francisco. I think it opened earlier this year. Yeah, this year. That's where our oncology research is done. We have a nice site in Ludwigshafen, Germany, where neuroscience research is done. And then our headquarters is in Lake County. And so essentially all the products, the R&D work that's, that's done up to including kind of IND preparation and is further prosecuted by Lake, Lake County uh, 
And as you're probably all familiar, there are many, many diff different disciplines that are involved in the drug discovery process. I'm only really going to be talking to you today about what we do in medicinal chemistry and possibly a little bit of process chemistry. With that, I think it's important to state or start with that, you know, people ask me, what do medicinal chemists do? And I'm like, oh, it's pretty easy. We create drugs. It's much easier to say that than it is to do it. And we don't do it alone. There is a massive organization behind us. But even though we've heard through many talks today about designing compounds for a selectivity or specificity, it's pretty complicated process because in fact, at least with small molecule drug discovery, this is an oral route for administration. There are many barriers on the path to achieving appropriate systemic exposure of your compound. And even with the systemic exposure of your compound, you're particularly interested in its rate of clearance. And the reason that this is all important is, is that not only do you need potency for your target and, and selectivity, that you need the oral exposure, the free drug concentration usually drives your pharmacodynamic effect. And you can obviously measure a pharmacodynamic effect in preclinical species, but the most important thing to do is to really predict what it is going to look like in human. That takes a massive amount of data to generate here. Um, and that basically has to be contrasted to any essentially off-target activity that might lead to toxicity um, as predicted by in vitro studies all the way through in vivo studies. And thus, at the end of the day, what you really care about is TI or therapeutic index, which is essentially the concentration ratio between the desirable and the undesirable. Okay, so I think hopefully that explains drug discovery for you um, in a succinct enough manner. So let's get into the meat of what we wanted to talk about today. Um, and that really centers around designing compounds that have the appropriate specificity and selectivity that you need to achieve in order to have the desired pharmacodynamic or efficacious kind of response. And really when we look at this as medicinal chemists, you can either do ligand-based drug design or you can do protein crystallography-based drug design or a combination of the two. But in essence, what you need to do is create some type of model where you can basically filter your ideas and assess the quality of your ideas. It can be a pharmacophore map and it can be a docking grid and there's various sources of software that we use in order to do that. The part that I'm going to talk to you majorly about is the actual design of compounds. So this isn't going to be a talk about how to screen large libraries and filter for compounds. What I'm going to talk about is where, how you actually do de novo design of new compounds to move your projects forward. And I'll explain why that's important. But again, there are some tools I would, um, suggest that can help serve in this uh, process of de novo design. I think that this is an area that additional innovation, frankly, is needed in um, because it's particularly important and I'll, I'll get to that. And then finally, um, even after the generation of ideas, you need to score and review and prioritize those, those ideas. And, you know, there's, there's various tools that you can use for that that depend on their throughput, anything from glide docking, I think we heard MMGBSA being used earlier. Obviously, we use Hyde scoring as well as Seesaw. And then you can get to the more computationally expensive when we use these, such as FEP plus calculations to predict affinity or even FMO type approaches to predict affinity and obviously viewing all that through through kind of spot fire. All right, so that's all nice, but I figured, why don't I illustrate this with an actual example? I think this is more relevant. And so what I decided to do here was pull an example from 
some of the work that we've done, which is related to inhibitors of PKC theta. This is an intracellular kinase that's expressed in T cells, for example. It's involved in both the differentiation and proliferation of, of T cells. T cells, uh, the effective function of T cells is critical to various autoimmune diseases, and in particular diseases such as psoriasis and inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis and, and, and even rheumatoid arthritis. So you're, you're like, yeah, Jeremy, that's not surprising. You're in immunology you're talking about these, these disease areas. But for a medicinal chemist, what we care about is the fact that this is a kinase. You've got your typical hinge interaction. Um, and this was one of our more advanced compounds and approaching crystal structure of this, showing the various interactions that this compound makes in the protein. I don't know that I really need to go through the entire screening funnel because I kind of briefly described that on previous slides, but it's obviously it involves a lot more than just in vitro biology screening for PKC theta. You care about all the various other isoforms in the PKC family, um, as well as obviously kinases that are in the kinome. And then importantly, since this is an orally administered drug, you have your various ADME properties that you can do in vitro that can predict for your in vivo PK studies that, that helps limit what you take into your in vivo studies. Here's your CONA induced um, cytokine production, such as IL-2 or interferon gamma, in which case you can essentially measure the effect of your compounds in terms of its inhibition of those cytokines. And then various other assays that are run to assess off-target activity. The program started from a high-throughput screen, actually, that was run for this target, and we had a pretty weak fragment hit um, that was identified, and through subsequent optimizations in a, what I would suggest is a kind of classical medicinal chemistry manner, you can see an improvement of affinity for the type, for the compounds, for the uh, for the kinase of interest, uh, PKC. Oops, what on earth? Hang on a minute, guys. I'm not sure why that flipped like that. So you see an improvement in cellular activity associated with the uh, in vitro activity of the compound as well as its permeability, measurement of in vivo efficacy in an adjuvant induced arthritis model. This was probably one of the first compounds that we took into the study and we saw some toxicity associated with that. We, we felt that that was likely driven by this compound having a relatively high Cmax, and uh, in which case subsequent design led to this compound, which was equally selective. We showed good oral exposure. We showed a relatively low Cmax and extended Cmin. However, we still saw some toxicity associated with this compound and only moderate in vivo efficacy. Well, why am I why am I showing you all this? Um, because what kind of troubled me about this program and and troubles me generally about medchem programs is it took a long time to to run this program. And so this was basically the time period over which we ran it. It shows the number of compounds that were generated in any particular year. Uh, not surprisingly, we worked on multiple chemical series. I would suggest there was two major chemical series here. I'm going to show you some Shannon entropy calculations and some values soon. If you're not familiar with Shannon entropy, which I just suspect most of this audience is, um, I, I, I just show this plot to show that um, you might be more familiar with ECFP6. Shannon entropy is another way of measuring similarity of compounds. There's a pretty good correlation between Shannon entropy and ECFP6, as shown in this plot here. So whenever I talk about Shannon entropy, you can just substitute an ECFP6 similarity score if you like. But the point being that this took a lot, a lot of compounds to make over a long period of time. And one way of representing this actually came from some work that Maynard did out of, out of GSK. It's a very nice piece of work that, that he did, and so we kind of mimicked it um, like we often do in pharma. And you'll see here in red is this moving average ice score. That ice score is essentially a combination of various in vitro properties. And so, you know, as your PKC theta affinity approaches a certain cutoff value, let's say one nanomolar, um, it gets a relatively good score. Um, you 
basically sum all the scores together and divide appropriately. If you end up with a score of one, you've got a perfect compound. And so what this basically shows then is that over a period of time, you're basically optimizing your compounds and getting to more and more desirable compounds against time. The other part that I show on here, um, which may not actually showed in his slides, which is I found very interesting, was he used uh, the Shannon entropy score. And if you run Shannon entropy scores on a moving average of your compounds, you can well, I'll, 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 I'll interpret this for you, but this is the starting point. As you as you move down this slope here, the compounds are getting more and more dissimilar, and then as you start coming up, they're getting more and more similar. And so, what you see in a in a plot like this is that as you start kind of getting into a vein of activity or a vein of a combination of properties that you think is kind of interesting. Um, it's not unusual to see medicinal chemists making compounds that are more and more similar to each other as you're doing very small modifications to your compounds to improve various properties that lead into this score. However, at this point, and as I pointed out, that we saw some adverse symptoms associated with compound three, um, adverse symptoms, animal deaths, when you dose this at relatively high, high doses. And so then you see a period of time where a greater degree of structural diversity was incorporated into the design of compounds because generally we're not totally aware of what the off-target activity is that's leading to the adverse effects. And so the thinking is usually that you want some structural diversity, incorporate different pharmacophores into your molecules. Hopefully that ameliorates your target activity. I say hopefully because you don't measure it, um, because you don't know what to measure um, other than a PD outcome, um, while still trying to maintain activity against your target of interest. And so you see again here, um, dissimilar compounds being, being prepared, which is a, a good sign, and, and then an improvement in your overall score. You know, which leads you to a compound such as five. Um, so there's some structural diversity now that's, that's gone on from three to five through this optimization process. And this is the type of thing that you that, that I like to see, at least in, in, in programs, to make sure that we're simply just not making very similar compounds to this and, and, and then saying, well, we still see toxicity. You want to try to ensure that there's a more diverse effort going on in terms of your design, which there was. Um, and yet we still ended up with a relatively poor therapeutic index associated with this compound. And at that point, you know, management or someone like myself, I guess, can be comfortable that we pursued everything that we could have on the project. And now is a good time to stop effort. However, and I kind of alluded to this point earlier, it was like, boy, that took a long time to get there. And is there a faster way of getting to a more diverse set of compounds through the lead optimization process whilst you're optimizing the various parameters? And so what we did here was basically applied the fast grow technique that um, I think has been mentioned a little earlier by Marcus. And in which case, you can take what looks like your um, fragment hit that you got from your HTS hit. Um, and this is classically what medicinal chemists do. If you're lucky enough to get a crystal structure of it bound, and you kind of look at the crystal structure and say, okay, let me start making some modifications to this compound. Um, and indeed, classically, modifications were, were made all around this ring. They were made in this substituent here. Um, checking that we were, um, that the hinge binding was important, and no shocker there for a kinase, um, and additional modifications here. This whole process, however, when, when medicinal chemists go about doing this work, you know, requires them to start with a compound, essentially draw something on the end of it, model it, score it, and then ask, ask themselves whether or not that's a good compound to make. The beauty of a tool like FastGrow that I'm gonna go through and the fact that Christian um, was so helpful in this because not only did he provide us the phosphor tech tool, he also provided us a nine routine that allowed us to take this molecule and mark up every site on this molecule, all the stereochemical sites as well, and say, 
go generate me libraries of compounds, virtual compounds through each of these positions. And then obviously you can imagine once you've got those library of compounds, you can essentially dock and score them and filter them as I suggested earlier. So I'm not gonna show you the results of every position around here. You can just take what I show you in this one position and go, oh, I, I see it. Um, and that is in the case of here, you then basically create your library of compounds. It kind of looks like this when you look at them all kind of together. This, this kind of shows you the space or diversity of compounds that you, that you produced. Um, and then that is then what fast grow then docks against your protein of interest. Um, you might wonder, how did I get all those compounds that were formed? Well, um, this was quite some time ago, but um, Franco was kind enough to give us this nine routine that essentially allowed us to take our entire A room of, of compounds. Um, this is our corporate repository of every compound that's being made within Abvi. Um, suck it into a nine routine and essentially fragment all those compounds and mark up the fragmentation site such that you end up with a huge library of fragments that you can then anneal back onto your compound of interest. You might ask, well, why did I use the aroma compounds? Um, because these represent drug-like compounds as far as we're concerned. We, we think medicinal chemists that have make drug-like compounds. Um, and so therefore, if you then fragment that entire library, you're likely to end up with fragments that have been at least incorporated in compounds that we think are drug-like. Uh, so you can run this through this nine routine relatively straightforward, especially after Franca creates it for us and gave it to us. Um, and you basically just end up with a fragment file at the end of the day with the R star marked as the fragmentation position. And this is essentially what you take into fast grow in terms of a fragment file for it to use. All right, there's some additional details around here. Uh, um, we don't fragment every compound that exists in our ARAM for some reason. There are some medicinal chemists that have that were making compounds with much greater molecular weight than 700. I'm not quite sure why that would be necessary, but um, when, you, when you take the set of less than 700 and then fragment it and then just keep different sets of those fragments, um, you can just end up with a text file. And then with that text file, um, through the beauty of using Amazon Web Services. And I only show the um, hardware that we used here just so that it puts this in kind of context in terms of what we what we did here. This was relatively easy to run um, on this on this hardware. But essentially, if you take in the case of this database, uh, and so we generate the fast grow database here. It, it had about 3.8 million compounds rows within that um, text file that went in of a molecular weight range of zero to 200. It generates essentially a 31 gigabyte file. Um, some of the compounds that actually ends up with 3.6 million in there. Um, and so you've now got a relatively large database of fragments with molecular weight of less than 200, and that's what we annealed onto that PKC starting compound. Uh, in which case, those 3.6 million, million fragments using that database, when you go and run fast grow on this, which essentially does that shape fitting docking that Marcus was talking about, takes about two hours, 20 minutes to run. That was on that previous hardware that I, that I just described. And you tell it to output 10,000 compounds if you if you run the same thing, you can obviously change this number, um, 3.6 million, the same same fragment database. It took about three hours, 40 minutes um, to run. And, and then you say, you know, show me 100,000 compounds. In case you were wondering, the amino azetidine compound that I showed you on the earlier slide that, that kind of goes into this area, that that turns up in the 100,000 fragment set, not the not the not the 10,000 fragment set, suggesting that that possibly this is a more optimal number to actually kind of use going going forward. Uh, 
Let me go to the next slide. I think it's explained better here. Okay. If you take 10,000, and I'll show you 100,000, if you take those 10,000 compounds that you got out of fast grow that um, you essentially got, so recall you've got 3.6 million compounds and then uh, you, you basically outputted 10,000 compounds, 23% of those have predicted affinity of less than 10 nanomolar when you choose the ones with preferred, preferred torsions. Uh, I was, I was quite surprised in, in terms of how effectively it had outputted um, such a large number of compounds with high predicted affinity of greater than 10 nanomolar. Recall this is more of a, a shape fit that's being done against the protein and not necessarily a consideration of the various electrostatic interactions. You get the electrostatic interactions through your high calculation of scoring. And, and this basically, this plot here shows you that if you, if you bucket the various compounds in terms of an affinity range, and so let's say that you're particularly interested in the compounds with predicted affinity that are, that are better than 10 nanomolar, that would be your, your blue and your red, your red bucket of kind of compounds here that's, that's highlighted in this bar graph. This is a kind of um, a, a score that you get out of out of fast grow, um, and the bit that was a little troubling was that the fast grow kind of score itself, um, porous scores in kind of fast grow, you're still getting you know a set of your compounds that are that are relatively high affinity there, um, saying that it's still fitting from a shape, but if it's making appropriate interactions with the protein as predicted by Hyde, then they can be particularly active. Um, and so you, you basically then have to figure out why, right, well then how am I gonna filter this appropriately? Because you know I don't necessarily be wanting to work with this number of compounds going forward all the time. And that was relatively easy to do because you can essentially just take your compound set and run that through um, Maestro and look at the various interactions that your fragment is now making with your protein. And you can look at, or in, in our case, you look at compounds that, making, that are making interactions that you predict would lead to affinity. And as such, you can look at just that, that set of compounds that are making particular interactions with a protein that that you think you should care about. Um, in which case, when you do that, you can you can go and do that on 100,000 compounds rather than the 10,000 compounds. It, it looks similar in this kind of regard in terms of where the affinity, affinity kind of lies in different pockets. Um, but now you can come over to Spotfire and basically just look at the compounds that are making interactions with various amino acids that you care about. And then you can then just take those compounds. And as you'll see, I think in the next slide, oh, probably not in the next slide, you can do your MMGBSA orthogonal calculation of affinity um, and select what's of interest. I, I just wanted to repeat myself that even though I just talked about affinity against the target, that's only one part of the equation that we kind of care about. Um, and so I don't want you to go away and just imagine that we're just fixated on affinity. We're, we're certainly not. There are many other parameters that, that come into this, which is why the I score is kind of important when you're thinking about the compounds that you want to forward. Um, I'm not going to show you anything more about the affinity of PKC theta because the problem with PKC theta is, is that it's very in, very easy from a retrospective analysis to go back and go, oh, Hyde predicted the right compounds have the right affinity and didn't it do a good job of predicting my compounds? And it, and it, and it did. But um, that's, that's not useful. I would argue that the prospective case that um, we're going to talk about is actually far more useful in terms of the whole kind of process, because it's way too easy to convince yourself you did the right thing in a retrospective analysis. I just want to briefly talk about the fact that we do design synthesis. Um, and I think someone said it earlier that, um, you know, uh, what's the point in doing de novo design if you can't get the compounds made? Well, that's 
that's not a problem for us because we work in a design synthesis environment. The designers, you know, essentially design compounds for the procedure that I just kind of discussed. And then we have internal synthesis and external synthesis. And, and as such, this discussion between designers and synthesis goes on such that we can then go and make the compounds that we actually care about um, based on the prediction of our design. And that essentially is the beauty of the design synthesis paradigm because you can have a group of people that are experts in design and you can have a group of people that are experts in synthesis. And as such, you can make sure that you're making the compounds that are appropriate for the project. And I'll, I'll show you an example of how this actually kind of works. However, one of the things about design um, is that it's important to make sure that you're designing compounds that can be made. I mean, obviously, you can go and talk to your synthesis team and they can come back and tell you. But there, there, there are easier ways, I would argue, to go about and figure out what you what you can make or what you can realistically make. Um, when you talk to medicinal chemists that both do design and synthesis, um, it's a little sad, but most medicinal chemists will, will kind of tell you that um, they kind of make what they know how to make or what they're aware of. And we all know the synthetic literature is far broader than that, um, as is the design literature. And so that's not, that's not an ideal scenario. There was a very nice paper that, that came out from Segler in 2018, uh, and he was talking about tools that you can use to predict expedient routes to actually making compounds, describe this, this, this paper. And this is typically the reaction that you get from the synthetic community around what can actually be being, being, being done um, in terms of how various tools and software work. Um, I would characterize it generally as I don't need it and I, I don't think they're particularly useful because I can figure it out kind of myself or that it gives me routes that, that aren't really realistic. Segler did a nice thing in this, in this paper. He ran a double blind study and he basically took 45 graduate level organic chemists and he gave them compounds that were predicted to be made by his artificial intelligence Monte Carlo type approach. Um, and, and it would come up with a synthesis of compound, and then at the same time, he would um, take a literature synthesis of a compound and then present it to this group of graduate students and say, which of these routes do you think is more likely uh, to afford the final compound? And from this paper, um, well, he, he actually says as a pr preference for machine learning, I would, I would take this to typically mean that, you know, Machine learning did pretty good in this process. Uh, there were some that voted for the literature route, and then there were some that voted for the machine machine learning route. And so, as as any person would do, um, ran this test on my chemistry team here and asked them the exact same question. Gave them all the same compounds and said, "Hey, um, what would you do?" And turned out very similar results to what was what was published. Uh, about 50%, I would argue, um, for the literature route, 50% for the machine learning. Um, wasn't, wasn't done with individuals, formed, formed various teams. So we had seven teams and they had to basically say which of the routes that they liked best in terms of getting to the final compound. Beauty of that is, is that I think machine learning has come a long way in terms of predicting synthetic routes to compounds. Um, and there was this really nice publication that came out of AstraZeneca. I suggest you try this. Um, we certainly downloaded this software and stored it in Jupyter Notebooks and use it to help us rank the synthesizability of any of our de novo compounds. We enhanced it by essentially taking our corporate database of compounds um, that came from our ELN such that uh, it will do its Monte Carlo kind of disconnection down to a fragment that, or a molecule that it finds, and you know, lo, lo and behold, it finds something that's in our electronic lab notebook. It's very easy then for a synthetic chemist to go, oh, that's nice. Um, I can make that compound from this from this starting material. So that's what that's what we use that for, and I think that goes a long way in overcoming the synthetic issues associated with with compounds. Now. I just quickly want to give you the prospective case. Um, this is a 
project that we're currently working on, what we did here was I wanted to compare and contrast what I consider the classical kind of process um, to how you do virtual screening. So I took the same library of fragments that I kind of talked about before, and kneeled them all on, created the virtual library, did the FlexX docking of those with some template constraint, uh, and then did the height scoring um, of those compounds. The thing about this is this took several weeks to run in terms of getting to this point where you have these preferred high scored compounds. And so you can compare and contrast that to something that took hours when we ran it using fast score. Uh, however, the, the beauty of all this is you then do the SIFT fingerprint interaction. You can do your clustering such that you can look at the various compounds that are within a certain cluster that are making a particular interaction with the protein. Uh, we did a prime MMGBSA kind of quality control check, I would say, on some of these compounds just to go, well, you know, what does, what does prime MMGBSA say when we give the ability of the protein to have some kind of flexibility? So the net result of all of that is that you take a bunch of compounds over one million and we basically then said, fine, let's make these four compounds that came out of this. This is the activity of those four compounds that were made. All right, so seven, mic seven micromolar down to two nanomolar. When you actually think what went on here in this process in terms of you've taken a million virtual compounds and you've ran through this kind of process of docking and scoring um, and using hide and sift analysis and then said, okay, go make these four. Um, this is really quite a nice process or quite a nice tool. Um, you can imagine, and I can't tell you everything that we're doing around this, but you can run the fast growth so quickly on any of the different positions associated with this molecule that it's very easy to kind of iterate through all the various options that you could imagine for compounds that you might want to make. The summary of all this is that Within a design synthesis environment, it's relatively easy to create these GROW databases uh, within NIME. And as you can imagine, you can use the ARAM or you can essentially use any database or of compounds that's out there and kind of fragment them. And as you can imagine, you can compare and contrast uh, the compounds that are generated from, say, using the ARAM versus using enamine, for example. Uh, Fast grows blazingly fast in terms of how it runs. This is hours instead of the weeks that it um, took when I just compared it against what it would take to do it using a virtual library and running FlexX and height scoring. Height scoring is, is actually pretty fast. SIFT is a nice analysis to allow you to filter your compounds and say, which ones am I interested in because they make particular interactions with the different residues of protein that I might want to care about because the overall properties of the compounds are important. And so which pharmacophores you're incorporating into your molecules is important. Uh, Schrodinger Prime MMGBSA provides a nice kind of orthogonal kind of approach to look at affinity or you know, predicted affinity of your compounds and see whether or not similar interactions are being made or not. Uh, selected compounds, they are all assessed for the synthetic feasibility through those through those tools that I just showed you. And so at the end of the day, when it all works, it's really quite remarkable and that it's really quite enabling in terms of getting that done.